Namaskaram. Today I'm going to start talking about one of um, Bhagavan's small songs, but a very nice song. This is a song he wrote for his mother called Apalapatu. Um, Apalam is uh, probably most of you are familiar with Apalam, but it's named, known by various different names in in different English language and there are various anglicized forms of it. So uh, a popadom or a papad or it's various names it's known by, but it's basically it's a uh, it's a uh, <clears throat> it's a it's it's a very popular um, side dish. How uh, how to describe it? It's a I suppose a crisp round wafer you can call it, and it, the main ingredient is black gram. Um, how Bhagavan came to write this is that um, he lived for most of the early years. He was in Tiruvannamalai. He was living in Virupakshi Cave from about 1899, that's about three years after he came to Tiruvannamalai, till about the middle of 1916, he lived mostly in Virupakshi Cave. I believe in the very hot summer months, he sometimes moved to another cave because Virupakshi became uh, excessively hot in the, in the hottest months of the year. But uh, Burupakshi Cave was, the, was his main abode for um, 16 or 17 years. Towards the end of his stay there, in about January uh, 1916, his mother, Arahamal, finally came and to uh, live with him. That is, she, she had visited a number of times before. But finally, she came to live with him and, uh, because she wanted nothing else but to spend the last years of her life in the company of her son, who she by that time had recognized was a, a very great soul. Um, so it was during the, so because she came in January 1916 and they didn't move up to Skandashram until about the middle of 1916. For some months, she was living with him in, um, in Virupakshi Cave. And it was during those months that um, it, but he, he composed this song. In some books, it's recorded, as, I think in letters from Sri Ramasham, it's recorded as if he said it, it was in 1914 or 1915. But I think that is not actually correct because his mother didn't, according to most of the books, it said she came to live with him in uh, 1916. Um, how the, the circumstances under which Bhagavan came to write this song is that before, um, before his mother came there, uh, but, well, in, from the very early days that he came to Tiruvannamalai, from the very outset of his coming to Tiruvannamalai, Bhagavan, being a sadhu, lived on bed food. So uh, he, uh, for many years, he used to beg his own food. Um, and in later years, he said there wasn't a, there wasn't a street in Tiruvannamalai where he hadn't gone to beg his food. Um, that is significant because it shows Bhagavan had no, no, um, no sense of high or low. When he said not a single street, there wasn't a street in Tiruvannamalai that he hadn't got begging in, that means he didn't go begging only in the Brahmin streets or only in the high caste Hindu street. He went begging in all the streets, including the, the streets where Muslims lived, the streets where the um, the, the, the lowest castes live, the, or the outcasts, the, um, those who later became known as Harijans uh, after Gandhi, um, he, he, Bhagavan begged in all streets. Um, so, uh, but later when more um, uh, sadhu devotees gathered around him, often they would go begging food, and um, and bring it, and whatever was brought would be distributed uh, equally among all. So there was no cooking in those early years. In in all, in all the years Bhagavan lived in Virupakshi, they didn't cook their food. 
sometimes, um, for example, Kere Pati, she used to collect um, various types of greens, um, edible greens from the hill. And she would uh, she would beg for uh, rice and other uncooked ingredients. She would sometimes cook and make a dish of uh, rice and greens and serve to Bhagavan. But there was no cooking in Virupakshi as such. Um, sometimes people brought cooked food there, but there was no cooking there. And cooking really only began after they moved up <coughs> up to Skandashram. Slowly. Bhagavan's mother and others slowly started to introduce cooking. And by the time Bhagavan moved down to the ashram at the foot of the hill after his mother passed away a few years later, um, cooking had become a regular feature of the ashram. Um, but as I say, up to 1916, when his mother came, there was no regular cooking. Um, but one day, uh, Bhagavan's mother, talking to some other lady devotees, she was telling them that when Bhagavan was young, he very much liked Apalam, and therefore she wanted to make Apalam for him. And she also said that he, he, when he was young, he used to help her make Apalam, and she said he was very, very skillful in, in all that. He was very adept in all the tasks required to make an Apalam, which is quite, uh, if you're Nowadays, we can just go to a shop and buy uh, the dry apple um, and just put it in, uh, cook it in oil or over the fire. But in those days, they used to make it from uh, from scratch. They would make all the ingredients. Um, so when she said to some other lady devotees that uh, Bhagavan liked apple um, and that uh, she would like to make apple um, for him, the word quickly spread among the devotees. So some of the better off devotees in the town, they contributed the ingredients. So very quickly, she gathered enough ingredients to make more than two, two or three hundred apalam. Um, Bhagavan noticed what was going on, but he kept quiet. He wasn't happy. He wasn't at all pleased when he saw what she was up to. But he, he, Bhagavan could be infinitely patient, so he waited for the appropriate time. So, uh, having gathered all the ingredients, one day she began to prepare them. Um, and... Uh, since it was a large number of apalam, it was a, a lot of work for her to do on her own. So she asked him to uh, assist her. And he then took the opportunity to start scolding her. He said, what are you doing? You've come here. We are all beggars here. You've come to live with us. You shouldn't. You need to give up all your likes and dislikes. Whatever, whatever food is given... Uh, 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 you should accept. You shouldn't be hankering after this tasty food or that tasty food. Um, so she was disappointed because she was hoping he would help her. But anyway, she, she kept quiet and went on preparing the ingredients. Uh, but she was quickly, uh, she soon became, uh, it soon became clear to her that there's no way she could uh, make so many aplam on her own. So she again asked him. She asked him two or three times. And finally, he said to her, you make your apalam. You make your apalam and you eat your apalam. I'm not interested in your apalam. I will make my own kind of apalam. Uh, and the apalam he was referring to is this song. He then composed this song. One of the reasons he composed this song is in Tamil Nadu, there are many songs of this type, which are... Uh, songs about ordinary day-to-day uh, -day household activities, using those activities as metaphors to teach Vedantic truths. So uh, such songs, are uh, there are a, a number of such songs, um, but have been available for hundreds of years. And his mother was very fond of those songs. So he thought the appropriate way to teach her was let her do make her apalam, he would make this apalam. Um, so this this song is uh, describing, the, it is using uh, the making of apalam and all the ingredients and all the activities required to make an apalam. It is using that as a metaphor 
for spiritual practice, for the, for the practice and the, uh, qual well, what are the, the necessary, um, that is to make an aplam, you need ingredients, you need implements, and you have to go through certain actions. Likewise, in the spiritual path, we, we, we need, um, we have the ingredients, we need to go through the process of spiritual practice in order to, uh, to prepare ourselves to be swallowed by God, to make ourselves as an offering to God, to surrender ourselves completely. To surrender ourselves completely, we need to be willing to surrender ourselves completely. So for that, the, the process of, of, of Atma Vichara or any spiritual practice is, a prep, is, is preparing ourselves to surrender ourselves completely to God. And of course, the, the ultimate spiritual practice that we all have to come to sooner or later is this simple practice of Atma Vichara, because it is only by Atma Vichara that we can surrender ourselves completely. That is the self we have to surrender. Obviously, we cannot surrender what we actually are. We can only surrender what we seem to be, namely ego. And in order to surrender ego, we need to investigate ourselves. The reason being that the nature of ego is to rise, stand, and flourish by grasping things other than itself. As Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Uludhanaptu, grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes abundantly. Leaving form, it grasps form. What he means by form here is any phenomenon, any object, anything other than ourself. And how does ego grasp these things? By attending to them and being aware of them. So the na very nature of ego is to be constantly grasping things other than itself. Um, so, so long as we are attending to anything other than ourselves, we are grasping form. And thereby we are, we are nourishing and sustaining ego. Ego will subside and dissolve back into its source only if instead of grasping anything else, if it tries to grasp itself, it will no longer be able to stand, so it will subside and dissolve back into its source. That's why in the same verse 25 of Uludhanaptu, Bhagavan says, Tedinal Otumpidikum, which literally means if sought, it will take flight. Um, wh what that implies is if, we, if ego investigates itself to find out who am I, it will subside and dissolve back into its source because it, has, it cannot uh, rise or stand or flourish without grasping other things. So if instead of trying to grasp anything other than itself, if it tries to grasp itself, since it is a formless phantom, it will, subs it will subside and merge back into its source. And what will then remain is the reality of ego, which is just that fundamental awareness I am. That is what we actually are. So we can bring about, we can surrender ego only to the extent to which we investigate ourselves. So self-investigation is the ultimate means to, in, to surrender ego. All other practices are beneficial to a certain extent in purifying the mind. But ultimately, whatever other practice we may have followed, sooner or later, we need to turn our attention within to see who am I. Because it's only by knowing ourselves as we actually are that we can eradicate ego, because ego is nothing but a false awareness of ourself. So, um, so this, this song is about spiritual practice, mainly about the simple practice of self-investigation. Um, uh, this, this, this type of song is uh, what is known as a kirtana. A, a kirtanas have, um, have a palavi, which is the refrain, which is repeated after the end of the sub-refrain and each of the verses. It has an anupalavi, which is a sub-refrain, which is not repeated. And then it has one or more uh, charanam. Uh, charanam means, uh, uh, in this context, means verse. So this, this particular song, it has a palavi, it has an anu palavi, and it's got four charanangal, four uh, verses. Um, in the palavi, what Bhagavan says is, uh, apalam itu paru, 
a de sapitu un asee tiru. What that means is making a plum see, eating it, put an end to your desire. Um, Aplamitu means making aplam, paru means see, uh, ade sapidu means eating it, unase, your desire, unase ye, tiru, tiru means put an end to. Um, in some translations, it's put uh, satisfy your desire, but tiru actually means putting an end to. That is for, what Bhagavan means here is not that we should satisfy our desires, we should put an end to all desires. Um, sometimes, if we have a strong desire for something, if we have a strong desire to eat a plum, for example, we, the, 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 um, the craving for that apalam will be satisfied by eating the apalam. So in that way, we are, but that isn't really putting an end to that desire. But very shortly after that, the same desire will rise again. Such is the nature of desires. So what Bhagavan is talking about here is putting an end to desire. So when he says apalamitu, make, making apalam, what he implies is making apalam in the manner described in this song. He's not recommending that we take, make the physical apalam, but the spiritual apalam. Um, and uh, paru means see. We, we can take apalamitu paru as see how, literally it means making apalam see. It could be it could be taken to imply, see how to make up lum. But actually that C has a deeper meaning here. C means it, what it implies is see yourself as you actually are. In other words, see yourself as I am I. Because what we actually are is nothing other than I. So we, we need to see ourselves as I and I alone. Now we see ourselves as I am this body. Instead of being aware of ourselves as I am this body, we have to be aware of ourselves as I am I. That is what is meant by seeing, seeing what we actually are. In other words, being aware of ourselves as we actually are, or being aware of ourselves as ourself alone. Um, ade sapidu means eating it. Um, that, that implies by experiencing ourselves as ourself alone. Uh, unasee tiru, put an end to your desire. In other words, put an end to desire for all other things. Why we desire other things? Because we don't know ourselves as we actually are. When we rise as ego, we know ourselves as this, this little person, this little body. And so we have, we have desire for food, for clothing, for shelter. But our desire doesn't stop there. Whatever we, however many desires are satisfied, we have more and more and more desires. Um, so uh, it is the nature of the ego to have desire. So to put an end to all desire, we need to put an end to ego. And to put an end to ego, we need to know ourselves as we actually are. Um, so because Bhagavan's mother wanted to satisfy her desire to make kapalam, she her desire to make Apalam was not only because she liked Apalam, the, the main thing she thought she could please him by making Apalam. She, she remembered as a child he liked Apalam, so she thought if she makes Apalam, that will please him. And so he'll be pleased with her. That was her, her desire. But Bhagavan doesn't want us to have any desire at all. Um, so uh, what he implies is, Rather than making the physical apalam, but will temp, but will uh, for a brief time satisfy our desire. We there's another kind of apalam which, if we make, will put an end to all desire forever. How will it put an end to all desire? Because it will put an end to ego, who is the one who has all desire. So the apalam that Bhagavan is. Um, prescribing in this song is a medicine but will put an end to all desire and to the one who has desire. It will put an end to all desire by putting an end to the one who has desire, namely ego. Um, and the, the apalam he refers to, he specifies what is that apalam only uh, in the, right at the end of the uh, final verse, the fourth verse, he describes it as tanmaya apalam. Uh, 
Tanmaya is a is a uh, tat in Sanskrit means that. Uh, Maya is a is a suffix um, meaning um, composed of or of the nature of. Uh, so uh, tat plus Maya becomes Tanmaya. So it's apalam, which is of the nature of tat, meaning that, referring to Brahman. So the 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 apalam of the apalam of Brahman. That is the apalam we are making. How do we make that? That is what is prescribed in this song. And um, having made this apalam, how do we eat it? By seeing ourselves as we actually are. Uh, he also implies in the final verse. He says um, he not only describes this. Um, uh, the apalam as uh, tanmaya apalam, the apalam composed of that, in other words, the Brahma apalam. He says, uh, uh, before that, in, in that final line, he says, tane tanaha bujika tanmaya apalam. Uh, bujika means, um, it, it, it means to eat. It also means to experience. So what he's indicating by this word bujika, how, co how can we eat this apalam? Eating the apalam means experiencing ourselves as tane tanaha. Tane tanaha means experiencing oneself alone is oneself. In other words, experiencing ourself as ourself alone. Now we're experiencing ourselves as something other than ourself, this body. What we need to experience to, ex to know ourselves as we actually are, we need to experience ourselves as ourself alone. So, tane tanaha means as oneself alone is oneself. So, that is experiencing ourself as ourself alone. That is eating this tanmayapalam. That is experiencing Brahman as it actually is. Um, so, there's a lot of very deep meaning in this song, though it's written as if he's, Bhagavan is writing about uh, making an apalam, he's actually conveying a very deep meaning in this song. Um, so that is the anupalavi, as I say, it means making apalam, see, eating it, put an end to your desire. This, as always in Ketanam, the palavi completes the center of every verse. No verse is complete without adding the palavi at the end of it because the palavi completes the, the sense of the, the verse. So the, the whole song, is the, the gist of the whole song is making apalam of this type, making this tamaya apalam, eating, making it see, eating it, put an end to all your desires. Then the anupalavi, the Anupalavi is, um, as I say, Palavi means refrain. The Anupalavi means a sub refrain, but it's not repeat. Unlike the Palavi, it's not repeated. The Palavi is repeated at the end of the uh, Anupalavi and at the end of each of the verses. So, what he says in the, um, in the Anupalavi is um, in the first line, he says, Ibuvi tanil engi tiriyama. That means um, uh, not wandering about, um, yearning in this world. That is, tiriyama is a negative adverbial participle. Um, we can take it as not wandering, or without wandering, or instead of wandering. It, it implies instead of wandering. Now we are wandering around the world. Wandering around the world doesn't necessarily mean physically. We wander around. Our mind is constantly wandering around the world, thinking about this or that. So even if we are sitting in one place, even if we closed our eyes in meditation, the tendency of the mind is still to be wandering about the world, thinking about this or that. So that's what he means, wandering about the world. And why did the mind wander about the world? Because it's constantly yearning. It's constantly, engi means yearning or craving. So we all have desire. Desire is the very nature of ego. Why do we have desire? Because what we actually are is infinite happiness. And our real nature is infinite happiness. When we rise as ego, we are limiting ourselves as if we are a small person, a small body. So... As a finite 
a creature, we cannot experience the infinite happiness that we actually are. But because infinite happiness is our real nature, we cannot be satisfied with anything less than infinite happiness. So we always, as ego, we always feel something is lacking, something is missing. So since we feel a lack in our soul, we look to fill this lack from things outside. We think if I have if I have this or if I have that, I'll be happy. If I have um, more possessions, I'll be happy. If I have a more secure job, I'll be happy. If I have more money, I'll be happy. If I have um, more friends, I'll be happy. If my family are nicer to me, I'll be happy. We, we, we constantly seeking happiness in things outside. If I learn more, if I'm more learned, I'll be more happy. All the all prabrittis, all the outward activities of the mind, all the uh, movement of our attention away from ourselves towards anything else is all driven by desire for happiness. So it's that yearning for the infinite happiness that we actually are, but we allow our mind to go wandering around the world, believing that somehow or other we're going to get. Um, so I haven't yet attained that, that perfect happiness, but if, if my circumstances improve a bit more, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be happy. We live our life waiting for happiness to, um, to, to become available to us. It never does. Bhagavan, in one verse in Guru Vachika Gubai, he, he, um, he uses a very nice analogy. That is, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a tree in South India um, it, it's the English name for it, or the, how it's usually called in English is silk cotton tree. Um, I think if I remember correctly in Tamil, it's called vele cotton. It is a tree. The fruit of the tree contains small black seeds and a cotton-like fiber. So those, uh, the fruit of the tree are, are green in color. As the, uh, when they ripen, the, the outer shell of the fruit dries up and eventually the fruit will burst. And um, because of the cotton, it, the seeds will be carried in the wind and distributed. This is how the seeds are distributed. But the parrot, seeing those fruit, will think it's, it must be a tasty fruit inside. So the parrot will hang around waiting for that fruit to ripen. When finally it ripens, it bursts and only um, there's nothing edible inside. It's only cotton-like uh, material, which is used to, um, to carry the seeds, uh, to, to distribute the seeds. So Bhagavan says, like the, like the parrot waiting for the uh, fruit of a silk cotton tree to ripen so that it can eat, in it, eat it, we wait our whole life for happiness to come. We always think, Oh, soon I'll be happy. If I have a better job, I'll be happy. If I have better qualifications, I'll be happy. If I get married, I'll be happy. If I have more children, I'll be happy. And we, we, we are constantly seeking happiness in things other than ourselves. But whatever we, whatever we get, we always fall short of the infinite happiness that we are all seeking because nothing less than um, infinite happiness can satisfy us. So our mind is constantly wandering around the world, yearning, yearning to obtain from this world the happiness that we find is lacking in ourself. Because we see the happiness is lacking in ourself, it must be somewhere outside ourself, we assume. This is the mistake we all make. Actually, the happiness lies already within us. We ourselves are infinite happiness. We seem to be bereft of happiness, because we have limited ourselves, if we turn within and seek the happiness that is ever shining in our own heart, we will, we will know ourselves as we actually are, thereby shed our limitation, and then it will be clear to us that we are infinite happiness. But instead of doing so, because we seem to be lacking happiness, naturally, because if I'm lacking happiness, I have to find happiness somewhere else, outside myself. So we go out, we want, the mind is constantly wandering around the world, thinking about this or that. And it's driven by yearning, by, by desire for happiness. 
So that is what, so in this first line, Bhagavan is, is diagnosing the problem. The problem is that the mind is constantly wandering around the world, craving, craving for happiness, yearning for happiness. So what he says is, instead of, um, uh, of wandering around the world, craving for happiness, that's the first line. In the second line, he says, Sat Bodha Sukha, Sat Guru Anava. Sat Bodha Sukha, Sat means Sat, existence or reality. or uh, um, Bodha means awareness or consciousness. So Bodha is Chit. And Sukha means happiness. So Sat Bodha Sukha is another way of saying Sat Chidananda. Sat Bodha Sukha, Sat Guru. What Bhagavan is, is indicating here is that Sat Guru Sadhguru is not a person. Sadhguru is nothing but Satchidananda. As Bhagavan often said, Sadhguru is that which is always shining in our heart as I. Sadhguru is not, is not a person. It's not something outside ourselves. Uh, Sadhguru is our own reality. But because, of our, because our attention is outward facing, for most of us, it is necessary for for our own self to appear outwardly in human form as Sadhguru, as Bhagavan, in order to tell us to turn within. But what that Sadhguru actually is, is nothing but Sat Bodha Sukha, uh, that uh, Sat Chidananda, that pure being, pure awareness, and pure happiness. So Guru is not a person. Guru is not the body. Though he seems to us to be the body, we need to understand when we see the, 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 the body that we take to be Bhagavan, when we see a picture of Bhagavan, when we see his loving eyes, what is actually shining through that body, what is the, the love we see in his eyes is our own real nature. We are seeing our real self reflected outwardly in the form of Guru. The purpose of that form of guru is only to turn our attention back within. So that is why Bhagavan is the eternal guru. Many people think a living guru is necessary. What they Yes, of course, living God, guru should be living. But what they mean by a living guru is a guru with a living body. Bhagavan said guru is not the body. Guru is not that form in which it appears. It is because our mind is outward going, it is necessary for Guru to appear in a form. So for us, Guru has appeared in the form of Bhagavan. But what Bhagavan actually is, is that pure being, pure awareness and pure happiness, but is always shiny in our heart as I. So to, to know Bhagavan as he is, we need to look within. That's why all his teachings were, were so... Were, the common thread running throughout all his teachings, the one thing he's constantly um, urging us to do is to look within and see what we actually are. So that is what his teachings are all about. So he says in the second line, he said, Sat Bodha Sukha Sadguru Anava. Anava simply, it, it doesn't have any separate meaning. Um, it, it, anava literally means he who is the Sadguru, the, the Sadboda the Sukha Sadguru. In other words, it's Sadguru. It's just a way, for, for poetic reasons, he puts this word Anava there. It simply means he who is Sadguru. In other words, Sadguru is Sadguru. Um, and Sadguru is nothing but Sadboda sat Sukha, Satchidananda. Um, so how does, that, uh, how does this connect him with the rest of the sentence? In the next line, he says, Sepadu uh, sonna tatvam akira. Uh, sepadu means without saying. Sonna means uh, uh, said or told. Um, uh, tatva means the reality or the principle. So the, the principle or reality, but the guru tells without telling. That is the the tattva, the re what, what is actually real, cannot be expressed in words. So when he says, Sadhguru says without saying, Bhagavan's teachings are pointing us back to where we can discover for ourselves the reality of ourselves, only within ourselves. So 
um, his words cannot adequately capture what we actually are. He cannot, by words, convey self-knowledge. By words, he points us in the right direction. So words have their limitation. So the, the truth can be conveyed adequately, as Bhagavan often said, only by silence. So his, his verbal teachings, works like this Aplapatu and Duludu Napadu and Nana and Upadesh Undia and Naranacha Stutipanchikam, these are all, these teachings in words are all urging us to turn back within, to see who we actually are. Because turning our attention within to face ourselves, that is listening to the silent teaching that is ever going on in our heart. That is his silent teaching is that perpetual shining of himself as I. So to, to listen to his silent teaching, we need to turn within. So that, that, that tattva um, that he's referring to is what, as he says in, um, in verse 43, I think, of of um, of uh, Arunachakram, right? he defines what is tattvam. Tane, tane, tattvam. Tane, tane, tattvam can be interpreted in two ways. Tan means oneself. Tane means oneself alone. So we can take it, but he's repeating the word tane for emphasis. Oneself alone, oneself alone is tattva, is the reality. That's one meaning. Another meaning of tane, tane, we can take it as tane, tan. Oneself alone is oneself, alone is the reality. That is, what is the reality? It is only a clear awareness of ourself as ourself alone. Tane, tane. So the tattva he's referring to here is ourself. We are self of a tattva. And he points out that tattva through words, but he, that is, he points us in the direction where we should look. But the real revelation of our real nature, it can be revealed only in silence. His silent teaching that is ever going on in our heart, that is what he refers to here as sepa du sonna, told without telling, said without saying. So he reveals this, our own reality to us without, through silence, in other words, without saying anything. But as, in order to uh, get us to listen to the silence, in order to get to attune us to the silence, he needs to express it in words. Because where, how, where do we find the silence? The silence is only in our own heart. So his, his words are necessary to turn our attention within. When our attention is turned within, then we are listening to his silence, his silent teaching, which is ever going on in our heart by his mere shining eternally as I am. Um, so, Sagboda Sukha Sagru Anava Sapadu Seppi uh, sepadu sonna tatvam means the reality which is told without telling by which which the sad bodha sukha sadguru tells without telling. In other words, what he reveals through silence. Um, tatva ahira means which is. What, uh, what what is that which is? He describes he, that's uh, that's. Um, um, adverbial, uh, sorry, an adjectival participle or a relative participle connecting with the next line. What he says in the final line of this verse is, Opu vu ila o mori impadi. Uh, mori means language. Um, mori impadi means in, in accordance with the language or as per the language. Or, or can mean one. But it, but it also means unique or the, um, yeah, the unique language. And how does he describe that unique language? Opu vivu ila. Opu means um, uh, 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 equal. Vivu means greater. 
So it is that for, that for which there is no equal and no greater. So this unique language, but he, uh, um, through which he reveals the truth, there is nothing equal to that and nothing greater than that. That is the greatest thing of all, that, that language. And what is that language? That is the, uh, that language, which is the reality, but he reveals with, by speaking without speaking. So, in other words, that language is the language of silence. So, in accordance with the language, with the unequaled and unsurpassed uh, unique language of silence, which is the reality, that is, a, the silence is not just the means by which the reality is uh, revealed, it is the reality itself, that is, our real nature is silence. So, why, why is silence the only means by which our real nature can be revealed? Because our real nature is itself silence. So it's only by silence that silence can be revealed. So there's so much in these very simple words, Bhagavan is conveying so much deep meaning. That silence, that unique language of silence, which is unequaled and unsurpassed, is itself a reality. But Bhagavan is teaching us by saying without saying. Um, so it's so beautifully expressed here. So, the, 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 so the meaning of the whole, uh, um, the, this whole uh, Anupalavi is, without wandering about yearning in this world, in accordance with the unique language, without equal or greater, which is the truth that he who is Sadhguru, existence, awareness, happiness, spoke without speaking, and then we have to add the, the Pallavi here to complete the sense. So at the end of each verse, Bhagavan put, uh, at the end of this Anupallavi, and at the end of each of the verses, Bhagavan put up within brackets. Up is referring to uh, that the first syllable of the Pallavi. That's, that's the way of indicating that the Pallavi is to be repeated here. So, uh, so, without wondering about yearning in the world, in accordance with the unique language without equal or greater, which is the truth that he who is Sadhguru, existence, awareness, happiness, spoke without speaking, making Apalam see. Um, and uh, making Apalam see, uh, eating it put an end to your desire. So, uh, as I say, the, the Pallavi completes the sense of each of the verses. As also another um, Ketanam that Bhagavan wrote is um, Anma Vidde. Anma Vidde is uh, the Pallavi and the Anu Pallavi, the refrain and sub refrain for Anma Vidde were actually written by Murugana. But, but the fact that Bhagavan wrote the, the five verses of Anma Vidde, each of which is completed by the Pallavi. Bhagavan is giving his, his stamp of approval to what Murugana says in the Pallavi, which is ayeyati sulapum, anma bide, ayeyati sulapum. Extremely easy, ah, extremely easy is this uh, apma bidya. Um, so, like that, like that, that Pallavi of anma bide completes the meaning of each verse. The, the, the Pallavi of this song completes the meaning of each verse. Um, so, if we, um, I also, um, I, I, a link was sent to everyone for the online um, version. That is, there's an article in my blog from uh, just, uh, I think it was back in November sometime, I posted this article with my translation and explanation of this song. Um, in addition to the bare English translation, I also gave an explanatory paraphrase uh, to, to make it clear, to bring out a little bit more clearly the implication that is uh, contained in this. So uh, in the explanatory paraphrase, what I wrote is, without wondering about yearning with desire for pleasures in this world, in, according, in accordance with the unique language, namely silence, which is without anything that is equal to or greater than it, and which is the tattva, the reality, truth, or true principle, that he who is Sadhguru, namely Dakshinamurti, 
who appeared to us as Bhagavan, uh, who is Sat Bodha Sukha? In other words, Satchitanandra, or ex pure existence, pure awareness, pure happiness, spoke without speaking, making up a lump sea, eating it, put an end to your desire. Um, uh, so, so what Bhagavan is implying here, if we want to experience happiness, Instead of wandering around the world craving for the fulfillment of, of, um, of other desires, what is the one thing that motivates all desires? Whatever we may desire, we desire it because we think it will make us happy. If we didn't think something would make us happy, we wouldn't desire it. So all the driving force behind all desires is the fundamental desire for happiness. So that is what is driving all our, all our desires. So instead of uh, wandering around the world craving for the fulfillment of desire, we should satisfy this fundamental desire for infinite happiness by making and eating this apalam composed of pure awareness in accordance with this, uh, this unequaled and unsurpassed unique language of silence, which is the... the what Bhagavan is, all, is, is eternally teaching us by saying without saying. Um, uh, so, though Bhagavan did uh, give us teachings in words, Bhagavan often said the real teaching is only the teaching in silence. That is, the teaching in words are necessary because our mind is going outwards. But by merely, the words themselves are insufficient. But what is the power of Bhagavan's words? Bhagavan's words are powerful because they are turning our attention back towards ourselves. If we if we follow Bhagavan's words, if we, if we turn our attention in the direction to which Bhagavan is constantly directing us to turn our attention, in other words, if we turn our attention away from all other things, back towards ourselves, to see who am I, that is the way to attune ourselves and to listen to the silence, to his silent teaching, which is ever going on in our heart as tane tane. Oneself alone is oneself. Nan, nan, aham, aham, I am I. That is the, the, his real teaching that is ever shining in our heart as I. Um, so uh, that's the refrain and the sub-refrain. The main topic for today is the first uh, charanam. So from this verse onwards, as I say, there are four verses in all. Uh, Bhagavan, it goes through step by step the, the processes of making an apalam, uh, or using those processes as a metaphor. He he conveys these uh, teachings. When making an apalam, the main ingredient is black gram. Black gram is a type of uh, lentil. It's a black black lentil. Um, that is an ingredient in many. Um, South Indian dishes. It's, uh, for instance, idli or dosa. The, the two main ingredients in idli and dosa are rice and uh, black gram. So black gram is also the main ingredient in making apalam. Uh, so in order to make the apalam, you first have to, um, to uh, uh, grind the, um, uh, how is it? Um, you, you, you need to pulverize, you need to break and pulverize the black gram in what is called a tirike. Tirike is the, um, um, uh, um, it, it is, it is the, it's the, the hand mill, the, it, it's a round mill. You, you, that is, it, it's two round stones. The bottom stone has a wooden peg fixed in the center. The top stone, has a has a hole in the center which you put over that wooden peg on the lower one and it's also got on the side it's got another wooden peg which is a handle you can turn it round and round and then you pour the the, 
the grain, in this case, the black gram into the center, you turn it round and that pulverizes and breaks up the black gram to make it into a powder. Um, so that is what, that's the first step in making an apalum. That is what Bhagavan is, um, is uh, referring to in this verse. In order to, um, to so what he's, this is all, he's using all these things as an analogy. So what is the black gram in the case of, um, of, of this spiritual path? The, the basic ingredient in the spiritual path is ego. That is, ego is the problem, and ego is what we what needs to be what needs to be broken and pulverized and transformed into the tanmayapalam, the, 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 the apalam that is uh, uh, made uh, consists of that, the, 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 the consists of Brahman. Because what ego essentially is is only Brahman. That is, what is the difference between ego and Brahman? There is no difference, actually. But, uh, in substance, ego is nothing but Brahman. The difference between Brahman and ego is just a difference in appearance. Like, what is the difference between the snake and the rope? There's actually no difference at all. What seems to be a snake is only a rope. So there are not two things there, a snake and a rope. What seems to be a snake is actually only a rope. Likewise, what seems to be ego is actually only Brahman. So we, we, need, to, we need to crush this and pulverize this ego in order to reveal what it actually is, which is Brahman. Um, that is the, uh, uh, what Bhagavan is referring to here. So th this is the analogy, and this is what he's referring to. Um, what he says in this, in the first line of this verse, he says, Tanala um, koza chetrum adil vala. That means which grows in the field of five sheaves. Tanala means which are not oneself. Uh, so they, he starts with this is this, this first line is a relative clause because. Whereas in English, a relative clause always comes after the noun that it refers to. In Tamil, the relative clause always comes before the noun. So Bhagavan starts with the relative clause. So there's something, what he's talking about, is there's something that is growing in this, um, in this uh, field of five sheaves. What does he mean by the field of five sheaves? As, as he said, for example, in verse 5 of Uludunapadu, Udul Pancha Koza Uru, Adalal Aindum Udul Enum Solil Adangum. The body is a form of um, five sheaves. Therefore, all five are included in the term body. So what, when Bhagavan talks about body, for example, he often says, ego is nothing but the false awareness, I am this body. What he means by body is not just this physical body, because we never phys experience just the physical body as ourself. We all, whenever we experience ourselves as a physical body, that physical body is alive. So it's endowed with life. That is the, the physical form and the life. And it's not a sleeping body. It's an awake body. So in a body that is awake, there's a mind, an intellect, and a will functioning. So these five, the physical form of the body, the life that animates it, and the mind, intellect, and will that operate within it, these are the five sheaves. Um, these are the technical terms of these. The body is referred to as anamaya kosha. Ana, uh, anam means uh, food or particularly rice. But it, in this context, it means food in general. So the uh, sheath composed of food. What is this body built of? It's built only of food. Um, so the anamaya kosha. Then the life is called pranamaya kosha. Prana means uh, life. It, it, it's... In many contexts, it means breath, because the, the, but more broadly speaking, uh, the prana is all the um, 
physiological functions, but, but are operating within the body, the, the respiration, the heartbeat, the digestion, all of these are uh, collectively all the all physiological processes but uh, make but distinguish the living body from the dead body. All these physiological processes are what are called prana. Um, and uh, so we, whenever we experience a body as I, as I say, it's never a dead body, it's always a living body. So if the body if the life, if the body endowed with life, so the anamaya kosha and, and the pranamaya kosha together. And then since we always we experience the body as I only when we're awake or when we seem to be awake. For example, when we're dreaming, we experience a body as I, but we seem to be awake. We don't think we are dreaming. We, it, it, see, it seems to us that we are awake while, so long as we're dreaming. So in, in the, but whether we're awake or dreaming, there's always mind, intellect, and will are operating within us. So the mind is what is called manamaya kosha. In this context, mind means the grosser functions of the mind, the um, perception, memory, thinking, feeling, emotions, all these, the, the grosser functions of the mind are called manam. Subtler than these grosser functions, there's the intellect. The intellect means that function of distinguishing, of judging, of distinguishing one thing from another, that, that, uh, that, that, that distinguishing and reasoning faculty of the mind is called uh, intellect. And subtler than the intellect is, uh, the, the subtlest of all of the five sheaths is what is called the, oh, sorry, the mind is called manamaya kosha, sheath composed of mind. The intellect or buddhi is called the jnanamaya kosha. That's a, the jnana means that, that discerning or distinguishing or discriminating knowledge. The B, uh, jnana means knowing, and V jnana means uh, distinguishing uh, one thing from another. So that, that faculty of discrimination, that faculty of discernment, of that faculty of seeing clearly one thing, distinguishing one thing from another, that is the faculty of intellect. Um, but subtler than the faculty of intellect, the Vijnana Maya Kosha, is the Ananda Maya Kosha. The Ananda Maya Kosha is said to consist of vasanas. Vasanas means inclinations. Vasanas are the seeds that give rise to likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and so on. So what is called the Ananda Maya Kosha is nothing but the will, the, the, what is otherwise called chittam, the will, which consists only of these vasanas. So the totality of all of our vasanas, of all the seeds that give rise to our likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and so on, is what is called Ananda Maya Kosha. The Anandamaya Kosha, the reason it's called Anandamaya is because what is the driving, the motivating force behind all, all vasanas, all vasanas ultimately are motivated by our fundamental desire for happiness. That is, we, we cannot for a moment remain without desiring happiness because happiness is our very nature. And so love for happiness is our very nature. When we limit ourselves, that love for ourselves as we actually are, as infinite happiness, takes the form of desire for this or that because we think we're going to obtain happiness from all these external things. So because the will is driven by the fundamental desire for happiness, which is nothing but a reflection of the infinite love that we, as we actually are, have for ourselves as we actually are, the, the will is called the Anandamaya Kosha. It is also called the Karana Sarira. Karana Sarira means the causal body. In what sense is it the causal body? The vasanas are the seeds that give rise to everything else. That is, all the, all the other four sheaths are included in the Karana Sarira in seed form as vasanas. So what appears as intellect, mind, uh, life, uh, body, are all nothing but a sprouting of the Vishaya Vasanas. The Bish Bhagavan often distinguish 
two fundamental types of vasanas. There's vishaya vasanas and sat vasanas. Vishaya means any object or phenomenon. Anything other than ourself is a vishaya. So, and so a vishaya vasana is the inclination to, uh, to experience anything other than ourself. Uh, so those vishaya vasanas are the seeds they give rise to all vishayas. So all phenomena, this whole vast universe, is nothing but a projection of our own vishaya vasanas. So the vishaya vasanas are the seeds that give rise to everything else. So they are called, uh, so uh, collectively, all, all vasanas are called, vishaya, uh, are called karana sarira, the causal body. However, as I say, Bhagavan distinguished two types of vasanas. The vast majority of our vasanas are vishaya vasanas. But there is another type of vasana. That is uh, what Bhagavan called sat vasana. That is the inclination just to be as we actually are. Or be, whereas vishaya vasanas are the inclination to attend to anything other than ourselves, to any vishaya. The, the sat vasana is the inclination to attend only to our own being. And when we attend to our being, we remain as our being. So we can take it as the inclination to attend to our being or the inclination to be as we actually are. So that, that is also there. So our, our task when we are practicing self-investigation or any spiritual practice, we are trying to strengthen the sat vasana and weaken all the vishaya vasanas. How do we do so? By holding on to sat, by holding on to what is real. What is real? Only I am. So by holding on to I am, we strengthen the sat vasana and we weaken all the other vasanas. So the, the, this, this, these five sheaths, the, the, the body, life, mind, intellect, and will, Bhagavan compares these to a field. And, and, but he said this, this, this field consisting of five sheaths is tanala, it's something other than ourselves. But in this field, uh, something is growing. What is growing? He says in the next, um, in the next line of the verse, he says, um, Tanenum manum am uh, uh, danya ulande. Um, that is the danya ulande means the black gram. Uh, Danya usually um, means coriander, but in this, it, Danya actually has a broader meaning. It means any, any grain, any seed is Danya. So here he's not referring to coriander. What he means by Danya here is the seeds of the, of the black gram, the black gram seeds. Um, <coughs> but both that black gram seeds, he describes it as uh, Tan enum manamam danya ulande. So the black seed grams are here used as uh, he, he's, he's using the black seed gram as a metaphor for the tan enum manam. The, 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 uh, the manam, I, myself, the manam called myself. That is what Bhagavan means here is the, the word manam is a very Oh, manam or abhimanam, they both mean the same. Abhimanam is, a, is an intensified form of manam. But what both, what both manam and abhimanam mean, uh, the basic meaning of manam, or how it's used in common language, manam or abhimanam, means pride or conceit or egotism or a conception of oneself. Any conception we have of ourselves is manam. So, the fundamental conception we have of ourselves when we rise as ego is I am this body, this body consisting of five sheaths. So that false conception of ourselves as this body and the pride we take in this body, I am such an important person. I, um, we, 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 we all have a, a certain sense of self-importance. Um, even the, in, in the, View of each ego, it itself is very important. Even if in the views of view of the rest of the world, we have the most insignificant and trivial and unimportant person. In the view of ourselves as ego, we are very important. So we, we have a pride, a conceit, an egotism. And all other forms of pride, 
are rooted in this fundamental pride, this fundamental conception of ourselves as I am this body. Um, so in Vedanta, the terms manam and abhimanam are used to mean ego's identification with and consequent attachment to whatever it takes to be itself. Since the, the what ego takes to be itself is a body consisting of five she's, the ego is often described as dehabimana, that is the abhimana for body. That means the identification with body and the attachment to body. To, to, uh, to body. That is, whatever we identify with, we are attached to that thing. If we identify ourselves as um, I am Indian or I am British or I am American or I am French or I'm German, by identifying ourselves with that, we have a certain attachment to that. Um, if we identify ourselves, I am a I am a Hindu or I'm a Buddhist or I'm a Sikh or I'm a Jain or I'm a uh, uh, a Jew, or I'm a Muslim, or I'm a Christian, or I'm a, a Taoist, or whatever. Again, there's a by 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 identifying ourselves with something, we are, we attach ourselves to that thing. So the the word manam or abhimanam conveys the sense both of attachment and of identification. So it's got a very deep meaning. This word manam, but it's very difficult to adequately translated in English. So what Bhagavan refers to here as manam, he's referring to the dehabi manam, the attachment and identification of ourself as a body. And he says, tanenam manam, that is, we take that body to be oneself. So what, 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 what these two lines mean, that the uh, first two lines mean the, the black gram, which is the which is the attachment or the identification, myself, uh, this is myself, that grows in this body, in, in, the, in this field, consisting of five sheaths, which is not one, which is not ourself. So though this, this uh, field of five sheaths is not ourself, we take it to be ourself. And so this ego, he comparing to uh, a crop, which is growing in a field, the, the field is the five sheaths, which are not oneself, but this, what grows in this field, saying I am this field, is, uh, is ego. So it's uh, what Bhagavan is, is describing here, it's actually very deep and very subtle. That is, but the manam here is referring to ego, the dehabi manam, the attachment to ourself as a body, the attachment to, sorry, the attachment to a body as ourself. We take the body to be ourself. That's why he says, tanenam manam, the, 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 the attachment of the identification which says myself or which says oneself. That is, we take this body, to this, this field of five sheaths to be ourself. That is, that is ego. So the, the black gram in this uh, uh, analogy, the black gram is ego, which is nothing but that false identification of ourself as this body consisting of five sheaths, which is not ourself. Um, uh, so what what are we to do with this? Um, how, how are we to break this, uh, this this black gram, this this ego that is flourishing, that is growing uh, flourishingly in this body consisting of five sheaths? The, the solution is that that is in the next in the third line. The, the implement in which the black gram is uh, uh, crushed is called a hand mill. In Tamil, it's called tirike. I told you it's a, it's a round, it's, it's two round stones, one on top of the other with a central peg, and you turn it round and feed the grain in the hole at the center, just beside the wooden peg, and thereby uh, crush the, um, the black gram. So the, what is the tirike? What is the hand mill by which we can crush this ego. Um, the hand mill is, he described very beautifully here, um, uh, nana en jnana vichara tirikeil. In the hand mill, which is the jnana vichara, who am I? The jnana vichara called who am I? 
Jnana vichara, jnana means awareness. So in this context, it means awareness. So jnana vichara means awareness investigation. What is the awareness that we have to investigate? It's only the, what is the fundamental awareness? We're aware of so many things, but underlying, whatever we may be aware of, the one underlying awareness, the one fundamental awareness is the uh, awareness of our own existence, I am. So that is the awareness that is referred to in jnana vichara. So jnana vichara means investigating that fundamental awareness, I am. That's why he says, he, he says that jnana vichara is called, who am I? In other words, what we are to investigate, we have to investigate who am I? What, 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 what this I actually is? That is, there's this fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am. What is this fundamental awareness? Who am I? Um, so that is the hand mill in which we can crush these black gram grains, which are nothing, that is the ego, which he compares to black gram grains. So when we, when we, um, when we, uh, 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 crush the, uh, when, we, when we put the grains in this handle and turn it round and round, we are, we are, we are breaking the black gram seeds and pulverizing them. This is what he refers to in the last line. Nan ala indre uditu poditu. Uditu means breaking, poditu means powdering, uh, uh, reducing to powder, pulverizing. And he says, nan ala endre, as not I. What does he mean by as not I? Now we are taking these five sheaths as I. So by, by, this, by this practice of self-investigation, by holding on to I, we are, we are breaking this false identification. Now we're aware of ourselves as I am this body. Our aim in Atma Vichara, we are trying to hold on to I am and to let go of the body. So the more we hold on to I am, the more the adjuncts, the body, will drop off. Body means all the five sheaths will drop off. That is why these five, five, sleeves, five sheaths seem to be clinging to us, because we are clinging to them. As Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Uludnaptu, um, um, Urupatriundam, grasping this form of five sheaths, we come into existence. Uh, grasping it, we stand. So without grasping this form of five sheaths, we cannot rise or stand as ego. So um, it's we who are holding on to the five sheaths, not the five sheaths are holding on to us. So if instead of attending to anything other than ourselves, if we attend to ourselves alone, if we attend just to I am, we are thereby letting go of these five sheaths. So the five sheaths will drop off to the extent to which we hold on to ourselves. So by how do we in it is often often there's a term used in old text, neti neti. Neti neti means um, na means not. Uh, iti means um, it, it's a it's like inverted commas in English. So neti neti means not not. What it's referring to is we everything that is not ourself, we are negating it. So neti neti means that process of negation. But actually, what is described as neti neti is just the preliminary. We first need to understand what we are not in order to investigate what we actually are. So the process of neti neti is just the the the, 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 uh, the conceptual analysis that enables us to understand why we are not this body or this prana or this mind or this intellect or this will, why none of these things are ourselves. We have to clearly understand it because only when we clearly understand that we are not any of these phenomena, these are all tan alive, they're all something other than ourselves, will we be able to hold on to what we actually are. So long as we think I am this body or I am this mind, we'll be holding on to something other than ourselves. 
so we first need to understand that we are not any phenomenon. We're not any of these five sheets. We are that which is that fundamental awareness I am. That is what we actually are. So that is what we need to investigate. So how do we, when Bhagavan says we need to, we need to, um, we need to break and pulverize the background seeds as not I, what he means by when we hold by that is when we hold on to what we actually are, we are thereby automatically negating what we are not. That is, when, so long as we are holding on to these things, they seem to be ourselves. When we hold on to I, our identification with these other sheaths drop off. Instead of being aware of ourselves as I am this or I am that, we begin to become more clearly aware of ourselves as I am I, I'm nothing other than I. So, uh, so the more we clearly we see ourselves as we actually are, the more we will we will separate ourselves from these bo- from these five sheaths. So we will begin to recognize that all the, these five sheaths that till now we took to be myself. We took with so much pride and attachment and. Um, with um, that, so much abhimanam. With this is my, I am this. I am such and such a person. I have, have uh, everything about this person that we identify with. That is the manam. So the, this, what we till now with so much pride and egotism taken to be ourselves, we we begin to separate ourselves from it as it becomes not I. We we no longer. That is, of course, we don't. When we start off on this path of self-investigation, we don't completely separate ourselves, but we are beginning the process of recognizing ourselves as I alone and thereby separating ourselves from all these other things which are not ourselves. That's what Bhagavan means by saying, uh, na nala indre, as not I. That is by holding on to what is I, everything else is separated from us as not I. So it's not that we are to think this body is not I, this mind is not I, this will it. thinking like that is of course we need to understand that, but we shouldn't be thinking that. In order to separate ourselves from these, we need to hold on to what we actually are. What we actually are is that fundamental awareness I am. So here in this verse, Bhagavan is describing the practice of self-investigation. How do we practice self-investigation? just by holding on to I. What are we investigating? Who am I? We're investigating that fundamental awareness, jnana, but we actually are. That is that pure awareness I am. By holding on to that, we separate ourselves uh, from these five sheaths that we now, which are not ourselves, but we now take to be ourselves. So this is, this is what he compares to uh, breaking and pulverizing the black gram uh, grains, um, and as not I, we we that we separate ourselves from them by holding on to ourselves. So, as you can see, if you see this sentence, this, this verse, well, the whole the whole verse means in the handmill of awareness of, of jnana vichara, awareness investigation. Who am I? Breaking and pulverizing the black gram grains, which are the identification myself, but grows in this the field of five sheaths, which is not oneself, as not I, that is an incomplete sentence because the, the verbs in these sentences, the, the final two verbs are uditu and poditu. These are both the adverbial participles. They're not a main verb. So where is the main verb? The main verb, of course, is included in the, um, in the uh, Pallavi in the refrain. So, be, be, as I said, e, none of these verses are complete without including the refrain. So, be, the idea is in the handmill of, of Jnana Vichara, who am I, breaking and pulverizing the black gram grains, which are the identification myself, but grows in this, the field of five she's, which is not oneself, as not I, that is, break, breaking and pulverizing them as not I thereby making apalam see, uh, eating it put an end to your desire. So um, 
as, as in the case of uh, uh, Anupalavi, in, in the case of um, this uh, first verse, I, uh, I wrote the translation, which is just the bare meaning of the words, and I also wrote an explanatory paraphrase. What I wrote in the explanatory paraphrase is, in the handmill of Jnana Vichara, awareness investigation, which is the practice of being keenly of self-attentive in order to see who am I, breaking and pulverizing the black ground seeds, which are the mana, attachment, identification, pride, or conceit, myself. In other words, the dehabi mana, the proud identification and attachment to attachment, uh, this field of five sheaths is myself. Um, so this mana that grows and flourishes in this, the field of five sheaths, namely the body, life, mind, intellect, and will, uh, which are not oneself, which is not oneself, this field of five sheaths is not oneself, thereby separating that entire field of five sheaths from oneself is not I, making a plum see, eating it, put an end to your desire. So Bhagavan begins this verse by saying, uh, Tana la, uh, Tana la ain koza kshetram, this field of five sheaths, which is not oneself. The reason, they, they, one, one of the reasons that Bhagavan often gave for why this field of five sheaths is not ourself is all these five sheaths are jada. They are all objects perceived by us. This body is obviously an object perceived by us. The ob this body has no awareness of its own. We are aware of ourselves as I am this body, so this body seems to be uh, to have awareness, but it's not the body that is aware, it is we who are aware of the body. Likewise with the prana, the breathing, the heart built, or the heart beat, and all the other physiological functions, these are all objects uh, but, uh, perceived by us. A doctor can examine the body and listen to your heart and uh, check on your digestion, do endoscopy and uh, CT scan and all, and they can study all the physiological functions in the body. But these, so these are all objects. You know, so they are jada. They are not, uh, they have no awareness of their own. Likewise with the mind, the grosser functions of the mind are perception, um, uh, memory, um, thoughts, feelings, uh, um, uh, uh, emotions and so on, all these are objects perceived by us. That is, the, the perceptions the, the, the perceptions are things that we perceive, They things that are known by us. The memories, who is it who remembers? I remember. It's not the memories don't remember themselves. We remember the memories. Who is it who thinks? I think. The thoughts don't think themselves. We are the ones who are thinking. So the 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 perceptions are not aware of themselves. The, the memories are not aware of themselves. The thoughts are not aware of themselves. The emotions are not aware of themselves. They're all objects perceived by us. And likewise with the intellect, the working of the intellect, the reasoning, the dis discriminating, judging, these are all functions perceived by us. Likewise with the will, the, the grosser form of the will is all our likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, fears, and so on. These are all things known by us. A desire doesn't desire anything. It is we who desire. So the desire is something known by us, something experienced by us. And the seeds that give rise to all these likes, dislikes, desires, fears, and so on is other vasanas, even these vasanas we are aware of, that is when we are inclined to think about this or to think about that, we're aware of those inclinations. So they're all objects. So all these five sheaths are objects perceived by us. Because they're objects, they're jada. And because they're jada, they are also, according to Bhagavan, they are asat. They don't actually exist. This is what Bhagavan says in verse 22 of Rupadesh Undia. What he says in verse 22 of Rupadesh Undia is Udul Pori Ullam Weir Irul Elam Jadam Asat Anadal uh, Undipara Satana Nanala Undipara. What that means is Udul means is referring to the uh, 
the body. Pori, pori means sense, but he, in this context, it's referring to the mind. Ullam means heart or mind. In this context, it means intellect. Riya means the life, the prana. Irul means darkness. Here it's referring to the darkness of vasana, the darkness of desire. The fi, the, the, that is the, the, um, the Anandamaya Kosha is often referred to as darkness because the um, because thoughts are darkness. That is the um, the, the, uh, the, the vasanas are darkness. Because why are they darkness? Because the vasanas take our attention away from ourselves. We are the light. So when we allow our attention to be swayed to attend to things other than ourselves, we are facing away from the light. So the vasanas that draw our attention away from ourselves are called darkness. Um, in the first verse of Anma Bidde, Bhagavan, um, Bhagavan describes uh, um, thoughts as darkness. So anything other than ourself is darkness. And the seeds that give rise to the appearance of all other things are the vasanas, so they are darkness. That's why Bhagavan refers to them as darkness here. Um, another reason that is often given in the traditional text, why the Anandamaya Kosha is called darkness, because it is generally believed that when everything else ceases to exist in sleep, the Karana Sarira remains. So the dark, so the, 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 the Anandamaya Kosha or Karana Sarira is often considered to be the darkness of ignorance that exists in sleep. But Bhagavan has has revealed something much deeper than this. Bhagavan says, sleep is not a state of darkness. It's a state of pure light. Darkness or ignorance is waking and dream a pure ignorance, pure darkness. Sleep is a state of pure light because in sleep, there is no ego. In the absence of ego, there can't be any vasanas because vasanas are whose vasanas? Only ego's vasanas. So it's only because when we come out of sleep, we say, okay, if ego didn't exist in sleep, then how has it come out of sleep? We want an explanation. So but to satisfy us, the old text used to, in many texts it is said, yes, though ego doesn't exist in sleep, the vasanas remain, and the vasanas are what cause ego to rise. But how can vasanas exist without ego? As Bhagavan says in verse 26 of Uludunaptu, when ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. When ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Since ego doesn't exist in sleep, as he clearly indicates, for example, in verse 21 of Upadesha India, he says, Nanatra Tukotam, in sleep which is devoid of I. I there is referring to ego. So there's no ego in sleep. What exists in sleep is only that fundamental awareness I am. So Bhagavan always insisted sleep is not a state of darkness. It's a state of pure light. It seems to be a state of darkness only from the perspective of ego in waking and dream. Because Though we are aware that we slept, we cannot recall what we experienced when we, we slept because we as ego were not there. What existed in sleep was only our, our reality, only that fundamental awareness I am, which is pure light, pure, pure awareness. So sleep is not darkness, according to Bhagavad. That's why the, uh, equating the Anandamaya Kosha with sleep is not um, it, it's okay as a preliminary explanation, but Bhagavan has given us much deeper explanation, which makes this explanation redundant. So Bhagavan never Bhagavan uh, made it clear that sleep is not a state of darkness; it's a state of pure light. It seems to be a state of darkness. Why? Because as he, what shone in sleep is only pure awareness, what we actually are, but. As ego, we are never aware of ourselves as we actually are because we're now aware of ourselves as I am this body. So from our perspective, sleep seems to be a state of darkness, but it's not actually, it's a state of pure light. Anyway, that, that's a bit of a digression. But anyway, I'll just explain why Bhagavan uses the word darkness here to refer to the, um, to the, to the, to the Anandamaya Kosha. It's the darkness of vasanas, the darkness of desire. So since these five, the 
uh, he doesn't give a because it's poetry. In poetry, you can't always put things in the, in the conventional order. So the order in which he gives, he says, body, mind, intellect, life, and darkness. Usually, the order is body, life, mind, intellect, and darkness. He says, uh, Elam, all of these, all these five are Jadam Asat. Since they are Jada and Asat, Jada means they are not aware. Asat means they don't actually exist. Why does he say they're Asat? Obviously, this body, this body, this mind, they all seem to exist, don't they? Yes, they do seem to exist, but they don't actually exist. Asat means what doesn't actually exist. Sat is actual existence, real existence. Asat means what doesn't actually exist. So the, the snake seems to exist, but it doesn't actually exist, because what's actually there is only a rope. Likewise, ego seems to exist, but it doesn't actually exist, because what, it act because what is actually there is only pure awareness. Likewise, the five sheaves and all phenomena, they are all not only jada, they all are sat. But another reason why they are sat, because jada is the opposite of chit, and a sat is the opposite of sat. Since sat is chit, Whatever is, whatever is chit is sat, whatever is sat is chit. Whatever is jada, not chit, is therefore not sat. Therefore, jada and the sat, they always go hand in hand. Whatever is jada doesn't actually exist. It only seems to exist in the view of ego. So since these five sheaves are all jada and the sat, um, uh, satana nanala, they are not I, which is sat. That is, what we actually are is Sat. He doesn't mention it here, but by him, we have to understand, since Sat is Chit, he's implying here, but we are Sat Chit. So, um, since these are all Jada and the Sat, they cannot be ourself, which is, jat, which is Chit and Sat. So, we ourself are Sat Chit. Uh, the body and, uh, and all the five sheaths are uh, uh, jada and the sat, therefore they are not I. This is why Bhagavan begins this verse, this uh, first uh, charanamba, first verse of, of um, Aplapatu, by saying, Tana la ain koja kshetram, in this field of five sheaths, which is not oneself. They are not oneself, ourself because they're jada and the sat. They, they have no awareness of their own. They're not aware of anything. And they are they are a sat. They, they, they don't actually exist. They merely seem to exist. In whose view do they seem to exist? Only in the view of ourself as ego. So what is this ego? If we investigate this ego um, by jnana vichara, by the investigation of our fundamental awareness I am, ego will be dissolved and all these five sheaths will cease to exist along with it. Um, that, that that we have to understand from other places. But here Bhagavan is just talking about the basic practice. First, we need to distinguish ourselves from the five sheaths. We need to understand that these five sheaths are not ourselves. Then we need to investigate. Since these five sheaths are not I, what do we have to investigate? Who am I? We have to investigate I. That I is the jnana vichara. Investigating I is jnana vichara. That is the hand mill in which we crush this ego. So, uh, um, in, in using metaphorical language, Bhagavan is saying so much in this verse. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Arana Chalaramanaya.